V1. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Terrain. Terrain. Pull up. Terrain. Welcome to the Flight Safety Detectives. Hosts John Golia and Greg Fife, two of the world's most respected aviation safety experts, talk all things related to aviation and aerospace. This podcast and the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel are brought to you by the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, PAMA, and Avemco Insurance, a world-class provider of aviation insurance and your one-stop for all general aviation insurance needs. Get a customized quote at avemco.com or give them a call at 888-879-0389. Tell them you're a listener of the show and receive a 5% discount. Now it's time to buckle up because it's wheels up for the latest episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Well, hello, gentlemen. It is another episode of Flight Safety Detectives. It feels like I've been gone forever. I haven't seen uh, both of your shining faces lately. So uh, it's good to be back with you. I know that uh, I have been out of pocket, uh, not only with family things, but work things. And so it's always good to be back with you. Um, In that period of time, though, we've had a lot of accidents. Again, we've had a number of flight instruction related accidents and including some prominent people who have crashed and most recently a billionaire whose airplane uh, went down off the coast of Costa Rica. Um, So when we start looking at accidents and of course GA trends and, and things like that, it's obvious that aircraft accidents aren't discriminatory. It doesn't matter how much money you have the fact is, is that if you don't do what you're supposed to do or you don't have people that you've hired to do what they're supposed to do, bad things will happen. And when we look at the prominence of people that have been involved in some of these recent accidents, of course, we also have to look back at uh, some prominent people that were involved in aircraft accidents. And most recently, and I don't like the way we use the word anniversary, Um, but it was technically the 25th anniversary of the passing of John Denver, um, who had died in a general aviation aircraft accident off the coast of California. And, uh, and the board did an extensive investigation, um, more so than you'd normally see in a general aviation accident of this type. And it's presumed that it's because it was John Dutchendorf i.e. John Denver. And so um, in looking at this report, I know both of you have examined this report. And John, you were still at the board when uh, when this accident was investigated. So um, we're going to be picking your brain about the thought process of the board as they went through the facts, conditions, and circumstances. But looking back at John's accident, he was flying an airplane that he had recently purchased. It was a uh, it was an experimental aircraft, a long easy, and it had been highly modified um, to, to the extent that it even had a different engine that then was called for in the original design plan by the Rutans. And uh, he had put an O3, the builder of this aircraft put an O320 uh, engine in it, a Lycoming engine in it which was bigger than the 0200 or 240, I believe, um, that the plans called for. So you had a little more power. Of course, your fuel consumption was going to go up. And, uh, you know, it translates to better better performance. But there are a lot of trade-offs. One being that it is a heavier engine, so you have to have ballast. And as the board got into this investigation and started looking at some of these build issues, Um, They did talk about weight and balance issues, and they did talk about design. And the prominent part of this investigation was uh, involving the fuel system. But before we get into all of the, quote, nuts and bolts of this accident, um, it was one of those unfortunate accidents where um, I knew John Denver. Um, He lived, his father actually lived right behind me in their house. John lived, of course, up in Aspen, but his airplane, he had a Learjet that he used, uh, Winsong Aviation, 
uh, was based out at uh, Centennial Airport. At that time, it was Arapahoe County Airport. And um, and I knew his pilot um, because his, uh, his pilots uh, lived not too far from me as well. And we happened to see each other at restaurants and that kind of thing. And I'd known John from up in Aspen because I had investigated one of his previous events <laughs> involving one of his many airplanes. And he had a, uh, a, a Waco biplane and he ground looped it and uh, it got a little broken up. And, um, and so he also had a Cessna 210 and uh, he had an incident with that, but it didn't require reporting. And so he did have a history of, you know, some accidents and incidents that doesn't make him a bad pilot. But then as uh, we get into this investigation, and I know, Todd, you've got a number of, of uh, talking points that you want to hit on. Um, John was out playing golf on the day of the accident prior to the accident. And he had just purchased this airplane. It was flown by another pilot. It was repositioned. And, um, and then once it was repositioned, it was taken out of service to be repainted and a new end number was being put on it to reflect uh, John's initials, JD. And the work had been done and John was excited to go fly it. But this was an experimental airplane. And the one thing about experimental airplanes is you don't know the quality of the build unless you, one, participate or are actually the builder, or two, you are very intimately familiar with the person or persons who have built that aircraft and operated that aircraft. And in this particular instance, um, as we get into this investigation, the board found out some very ominous things that put John in a position to fail. Um, he decided that he was going to go out and fly the airplane after his uh, little golf outing. He was only going to go fly for an hour in the pattern. And when he pulled the airplane out of the hangar, where it was hangered in California, there was a mechanic who assisted him in pulling the aircraft out of the hangar and they got chatting. And uh, the mechanic provided some good information to the NTSB about the, the conversations that he had had with John while they were uh, prepping the airplane. He did say that, uh, that John did a quote pre-flight, which I know that our John um, is always talking about. And the, uh, the mechanic had described John Denver's pre-flight as being 20 minutes long, which when you look at it on the surface, you're going, okay, he must have been pretty thorough in his, in his pre-flight. But one of the things that the, uh, the mechanic had stated was that um, John never looked in the fuel tanks. That is, he never popped the caps and looked in, but he did ask the mechanic um, to look at the sight gauge for how much fuel was were, were, were in each tank. And the left tank was about a quarter full and the right tank was about a half full. Now, what that translates to in terms of gallons, we know from what the spec says, but it's only a spec. We don't know exactly how much is in that aircraft because those sight gauges weren't marked. So all we know is that one tank had about a quarter in the sight gauge and the other one had a half in, <laughs> in the sight gauge. But John was only going to go fly in the pattern, do touch and go landings for an hour. And anybody that's flown an O320 knows that that thing is not a gas hog. That engine is not a gas hog. It'll burn depending on where you are, atmospheric conditions, leaning and all that kind of stuff. You know, seven, eight, nine gallons an hour. So if you do the rough math and you go, okay, well, if I got better than 10 gallons of fuel on the airplane and I'm only going to go fly for an hour, I got enough fuel. Because John actually turned down a uh, the, um, the mechanic who had offered to uh, to put fuel in the airplane. And again, the way it was written in the NTSB report was, I'm only going to go fly in the pattern, I'm only going to be up for an hour. So no, I don't need the extra fuel. Now, uh, he takes off, he does several touch and goes, 
and then decides to depart the pattern. He's out over the ocean at a low altitude, about 500 feet, according to the witnesses that were um, along the, the beach that uh, observed the aircraft. There were better than 20 witnesses. Um, there were varying witness accounts of what they heard and what they saw, but they all agree that they heard an engine sputter, the proverbial sputter, or had some sort of engine anomaly and they all agree that the airplane went into a steep nosedive. That is, the nose pitched down significantly um, and went into the water in that steep nose low attitude. And when the board pulled the wreckage out, started to examine it, and took more information from the mechanic, um, they started looking at the fuel system because the fuel selector valve for the fuel tanks was not mounted in its normal mounted position as you would expect from the manufacturer's build record. That is the fuel selector should have been mounted between the pilot's legs on the floor in the, in the forward portion of the cockpit, just behind the, uh, the nose wheel. The, the person who built the airplane basically told the NTSB, I don't want fuel in the cockpit. So he ran the plumbing to put the fuel selector valve on the back side of the bulkhead that contained the back of the forward seat of, uh, of this aircraft, which made <laughs> getting to that fuel selector not only difficult, but you had to be a gymnast. You had to be a contortionist to actually get to that fuel selector because where it was mounted was on the backside of the bulkhead over the pilot's left shoulder. And when the board started looking at and getting more information from the builder and looking at how this airplane was configured, they were able to determine that you really had to contort yourself to be able to reach over your left shoulder and try to turn a valve on the back side of that bulkhead that all you could do, you couldn't see it. All you could do was feel it. And you would feel for the detents because that fuel selector valve was not marked. That fuel selector valve was not visible to the pilot. So now you're flying this aircraft, trying to contort yourself to reach over. And as was told to the NTSB, and as was told by John to the mechanic, they both said that if I have to change the fuel selector valve, I will put the airplane on autopilot to keep it level while I turn around and change the fuel selector. Now, the three of us had a brief conversation before we came on the air and had a few choice expressions about that Mickey Mouse setup that are the most ridiculous things I've ever, I mean, that's just, that just defies logic. Uh, well, it defies a lot of things, but there are just so many different issues in this general aviation accident that put a pilot in a position of jeopardy, especially a guy like John Denver, who is He's, I mean, he had well over 2,700 plus hours according to his last medical, but, but he didn't have but an hour or so in this particular airplane. And this is not like a conventional stiff-legged tricycle landing gear or even a stiff-legged um, uh, tail dragger. I mean, this is a different kind of beast that he's going to fly and he doesn't have a lot of experience in it. And now he's got an airplane with a Mickey Mouse setup and nothing against Mickey Mouse. <laughs> but, but um, you know, it's a, it's a Rube Goldberg type fuel setup that just put a pilot, any pilot, in a position to fail in, uh, in where it was mounted. And I know that, Todd, you looked at a lot of the, uh, the docket information and there's a whole setup to a lot of the things that led to this accident besides this airplane in this fuel system. And if you just set aside for a minute, the fact that he was a world famous singer and what that, whatnot, 
he was actually from an aviation family. His father was a World War II bomber pilot. After the war, he was a pilot in the Air Force for a number of years, actually set a number of speed records in a B-58 Hustler uh, jet bomber. And John Denver himself, with 2,700 hours, he got his private pilot license in 1977. Yeah, his, dad actually, his dad actually taught him to fly. His dad was a flight instructor. And so he's been around knowledgeable people in aviation. He's been around aircraft. He owned several. He had the Learjet that you described. He also had two Cessna 210s, I believe, and the biplane that he had the accident in. And uh, the, the accident aircraft, the only time he'd ever flown that model, not just the accident aircraft, the only time he'd flown that model was the accident aircraft. He only had a couple of hours. To the best of my knowledge, he had no previous experience in basically home-built aircraft like this, experimental aircraft like this. So this is a different kind of animal. And on the surface, you would think, very experienced pilot, but maybe not experienced enough for this particular model. But it goes deeper than that. There are other issues about his past that calls into question his decision-making, long-term and short-term. Yeah, and, and we'll get into that a little bit. But John, you were at the board when uh, when this accident occurred. and. Um, there is some. There was some uh, discussion because the the board had to update this report because new information had come out. They had started analyzing some information, especially regarding his uh, his medical status. Actually, his medical being the FAA issued medical because of uh, some personal issues with alcohol abuse and that kind of thing that got reported. Yes, yeah, so at the board meeting when we approved the uh, initial report, uh, we didn't have a discussion around the alcohol. We had extensive discussion around that fuel selector valve, the operation of it, the fact that it was found in that intermediate position, you know, only partially drawn from one tank and blocked off on the other side. But the fact that the only way he, John Denver could operate it was with a pair of pliers that was given to him for that purpose by that mechanic that you were talking about. So we had a lot of discussion around the fact that that fuel selector valve was a problem to, to uh, change tanks in flight because he had to reach around behind him and use this pair of pliers to turn on the stem of the selector valve because apparently the, the, the handle was broken off on it. Uh, you know that we couldn't determine that because it was all broken on the ground when you know when the airplane was recovered but it was assumed that the handle was broken that's why he had to use the pliers to manipulate and make the tank selection and in so doing uh, uh several of the ntsp uh employees that are pilot rated had problems uh turning around and doing that unless they pushed their foot on the on the rudder pedals and which, just, yeah, which then would cause the airplane to to uh, first nose up and then take a nose dive. And and it one it, it it was predominantly the right uh, rudder pedal because he was twisting to the left, and two the way the aircraft is designed, um, it induced a lot of drag and yaw, which then rolled that airplane into a bank turn. Uh, an uncoordinated bang turn and then cause the uh, the nose to to uh, to fall out. Yes. So the, the other problems, you know, what uh, was he operating under the influence? We don't know. I don't believe his talks text uh, indicated that he was. I forget that part, portion of it. Uh, but we but really the board. I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. We really focused on his inability to change the, the fuel tank selection, if in fact he did run out of fuel in that one tank, which we believe. And, and when you start looking at what the board did, they did some post-accident testing. Um, one, they did uh, recover the fuel selector valve, and they were able to put it basically into an exemplar setup. And the fuel valve was found in in between the detents, if you will. So it was positioned on the right tank, but it wasn't fully in the full open uh, detent. So they 
put the uh, the fuel selector valve on a test bed. They hooked up a fuel line to the right side, but they capped the left port and simulated basically um, a, a, a pressurized system. They were able to run an engine, an 0320 engine, with that fuel selector valve in that partially open detent off the right side. The interesting thing was when they then removed the cap off the left port, which would simulate basically sucking air out of a dry tank, i.e. the left tank, the engine failed almost immediately because it had too much air. It was it, it just had an incombustible or uncombustible uh, mixture and the engine quit. And so in putting the storyline together, they were using that that now they said that the aircraft ran out of gas. Well, did it run out of gas or did we have a fuel starvation situation versus a fuel exhaustion? situation as as indicated because there is a big difference between starvation and exhaustion one being starvation is you got fuel it just isn't getting to the right place and um and their, test, and their test actually confirmed that the engine would have run just fine with you know fuel in that partially opened um fuel valve if the fuel air mixture was correct which would again, logically um, take you to the, the fact that there was still fuel on the airplane. It just was not in a combustible mixture. Yes. And we can talk about the uh, pre-flight in more detail later, but one of the things that struck me reading this report, the mechanic who had helped him pre-flight the airplane stated that he didn't see them actually visually confirm how much was in the tank. And I take that as a given that for smaller general aviation aircraft, part of the thing you do is look at the tanks because the fuel gauges, however accurate they are, they tend to be one of the least accurate instruments in the aircraft. And using your eyes to look at it and looking for various references inside the tank, you can easily tell whether or not it's lower than it should be or adequate. And that wasn't and, done. And, he, and he you bring up good... like two hours. And you bring up a good point, Todd, because this airplane didn't have fuel gauges technically. It had sight gauges, and these sight gauges um, were positioned in a place where the pilot sitting in the front seat, because this was a two-place airplane, sitting in the front seat could not see the sight gauge, which is basically the pilot's fuel gauge. And so when the airplane was on the ground and John was pre-flighting it, he asked the mechanic, hey, can you read that gauge and tell me how much fuel is in both tanks? When he was going to be positioned in the front seat, the mechanic gave him a mirror so that he could hold it over his shoulder and look and read the sight gauges. Really? That's the way we're going to fly this airplane with a pair of pliers and a mirror? Really? Come on. I mean, these are the kinds of things that one, it just I mean, it just defies logic, but two, why would a pilot, I don't care if it's John Denver or anybody else, why would you put yourself in that position in an airplane that you have zero experience in and think that you're going to be able to figure it all out, especially at 500 feet? And, and even with, you, you raise a point. If this had happened at 5,000 feet, it might be a totally different story. But this happened at 500 feet right after takeoff. And he was over the water. And in yeah. that situation, uh, you know, we talked about this before, but Greg, you can go into more detail. What is the absolute priority things a pilot should be doing in that situation right after takeoff at 500 feet, whether or not you're over the water or not? Yeah, well, I mean, you're, you're the one. I mean, we're all flying right now. Um, the biggest thing is 500 feet. If that engine starts to cough, that's going to get your attention. You're immediately going to do two things. One, you got to make sure you got your speed, your best glide speed. If you got if you got extra speed, then you're going to want to use that extra speed to get you extra altitude because altitude is your friend and it gives you it buys you time. You don't want to bleed that off and try and stay level. I mean, we all have a different philosophy on whether or not we should, you know, pull the nose back, bleed that speed off, but gain the altitude and then push the nose over to best glide. 
But two, while you're doing the, that that part of the process, you got to find a place to put the airplane down because if you can't get that engine restarted, um, you're gonna you're gonna be committed to putting the airplane down. And if you got the third hand going, if you will, you're gonna immediately want to switch the fuel tank. Now, in a Cessna 172 like you're flying, Todd, all you basically have to do is you know lean down and you know switch the fuel selector. But not for John. I mean, it it would require him to put the autopilot on, use his foot to get him tor you know, torqued around to try and reach over his left shoulder and then and then try to manipulate that fuel valve with a pair of pliers. By then you've lost the airplane. And it was obvious that that's exactly what happened. And the board came up with that particular scenario. And, and, and you mentioned the scenario where Immediately upon sensing a problem, a person does A, B, C, and D. Well, the average pilot might do that, but roughly half the pilots are not average, meaning there's probably going to be some hesitation. Uh, yeah. First, a realization that there's a problem. A second, an acceptance that this problem is not real and not imaginary. And third, putting into motion some plan of action and making that plan happen. That might take one or two seconds, or it might take five or six seconds. At 500 feet, it's going to be critical no matter how many seconds it takes. And this is someone who, in spite of his extensive experience, has only been flying this airplane a couple of hours and has uh, the first time he has an opportunity to switch the fuel tanks in flight is at 500 feet with the engine sputtering. Yeah. And that's why with the, and John, you know, you're familiar with all of this. We go to uh, Oshkosh every year. There are a lot of great experimental aircraft built. Um, and whether you build it yourself completely, you build it in conjunction with a build shop where you're doing, quote, 51 percent of the build. Um, you know, one of the big concerns that we all have is, especially in the safety arena, is looking at an experimental aircraft that has changed hands multiple times. This airplane had changed hands multiple times before John actually purchased it. And some of the concerns that come up with these experimental aircraft are the fact that if you don't know who the original builder was, you don't know the quality of the build. There are, you know, certain requirements that you build using a build book. You document all of the phases of, of building these aircraft, and that is the basic permanent record um, that follows the airplane. And then, of course, you don't need to be an AMP. You just need a repairman certificate to then do the work on the aircraft. But you don't know who's doing the work through this period of time, a lot of the times. And you don't know, uh, like any airplane, especially rental airplanes, like you're flying, Todd, you don't know the abuse that these airplanes are taking from these multiple pilots flying the airplane. So you don't really get that. And then... When, you know, you got a guy like John Denver who sees this cool looking airplane, but you look in the cockpit, don't you question, well, why is the fuel selector way over here where I can't get to it? And how is that going to have an effect on the way I fly this airplane? I mean, it just, it's the little things. It's never the big things that'll hurt you or kill you. And you know and, it, and it's the little things that we look for. That's why we do pre-buy inspections on airplanes is to look for the mechanical issues. But then uh, there are a lot of airplanes that are modified. They got stole kits on them and, and speed spats and all sorts of things. You know, are they truly installed properly? Are they going to do what they're intended to do? And for me as a pilot, am I going to be able to utilize these things without having to go through a lot of gymnastics to to make them effectively work. You know, in Oshkosh, you're looking at the best of the best. And Todd and I, we climbed all over several experimental aircraft, and including some uh, with stall kits on them. And, you know, they look cool, like you said, but without a bill sheet, sheet we couldn't really prove one way or the other to ourselves in our own minds whether or not it was done properly, mm -hmm. all that documentation. And I'm, I'm always amazed when I get around a bunch of GA airplanes and start looking at them, how much customization I see 
the owners have done. And that sometimes the, the workmanship is out and out shoddy. And sometimes those each, and that kind of work actually gets through an annual inspection, which I, I totally shake my head with when I see some of them where it's had an annual two months earlier and I see all this stuff on there. It's obviously been there for a while. And I said, how would they ever get through an annual inspection with somebody that was paying attention? And we see that on certificated aircraft that is manufactured by the Cessnas and the Pipers and the beaches of the world, you know, these, these shoddy annuals or hundred hour inspections or whatever. And so, you know, uh, we're not here to, to beat up on experimental aircraft, but it does take someone with a, a, a very high level of knowledge who's going to purchase this airplane or operate an airplane like this to really understand the experimental world and know the origin of that airplane. Because, uh, you know, I've investigated a couple where the guys who built the airplane built it as the manufacturer recommended, but then they decided to add their own in insurance by building it like a model airplane. Well, I'll just put some extra glue in here, some extra epoxy. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll put an extra hinge. I'll put a 90 degree bracket in there and screw it in thinking that they're making it better or safer when in fact they've actually made it weaker and, and changed the structure or at least the, the intent of the structure not knowing anything other than I think I can do this because I that's how I made model airplanes safer or, <laughs> you know, uh, structurally sound. When in fact that that doesn't translate necessarily to airplanes, real airplanes. It's all called load path. Where are you going to shed the load? you got to spread the load around the airplane. Yeah. Add, add a reinforcement in one, at a spot that it wasn't designed in. And now you've changed. You may stop the load from spreading throughout the whole airplane and put it all right in that spot where you just added an extra bracket. And yeah. now, now it's a place where it's going to crack open. So it's, it's uh, and I see that a lot. In, in, a lot. I, I've seen that a lot of times in general aviation airplanes where all of a sudden, where the hell did that come from? Who put yeah. that on there? And the NTSB, I mean, they did a thorough investigation, um, you know, and uh, and they came up with their probable cause about the fact that uh, that the design, it wasn't really the design, it was the modification of the fuel system, fuel selector valve location, and John's inexperience. Uh, they were critical of the fact that he, he didn't do a thorough pre-flight. That is, they attributed to, he should have put fuel in the airplane. I don't necessarily agree with that again, because if he had 15 gallons on that airplane and he was truly only going to fly for an hour and he only needed seven or eight, technically he had enough gas. Is it prudent? Not in my book, but it may have been in his book or some other pilot's book. So there's no regulation that says you have to have a minimum amount of fuel. It just says you have to make sure that you looked at all things necessary to operate that aircraft safely. And now, he did uh, not violate the regulations when it came to fuel. But when very it came clearly, to fuel, that's correct. Because very clearly, he was in violation of the regulations and should not have been flying when it came to his personal behavior. Correct. Uh, history mm -hmm. had uh, at least a couple of DUIs and had been notified by the FAA that his medical certification was not valid because of his previous problems and the fact that he still had not done what the FAA told him to do, which was stop using alcohol at all. He continued so, to do so. And so when we look at those aspects, we have discussed that over and over and over and over again on this show, and that is decision-making and judgment and the fact that you know, you're going to do the right thing even when no one's looking. And in this particular instance where, I mean, you have a pilot who knows that he's basically medically disqualified, therefore he is not legal to fly and then conducts himself as though he is, um, you know, did, did this medical disqualification cause him to crash this airplane? We'll never know. Um, you know, John brought up the point that the tox was 
uh, was inconclusive, but I, I wouldn't think that, you know, he'd be flying drunk or, or even uh, have any kind of alcohol in him. But the fact is, is that when you look at it against the grand scheme of things, and that is, you look at aeronautical decision making, and we've talked about advisory circular 60-22, and those characteristics of anti-authority. Well, flying when you're medically disqualified, that's anti-authority. You've just thrown the rule book out the window. The hell with it. I'll just do it anyway. Who's going to catch me? In fact, well, in this instant, he fits right into that mold right there. Yeah. He had, he's received letters about his drinking problem in 96 and in 97 before this accident. So it wasn't a resolved issue. He probably had an attorney that was fighting with the FAA over the issues and, and bouncing it down, you know, kicking the ball down the road a, a couple of times. So the FAA was, hadn't, hadn't actually suspended his license yet. They haven't come out and taken it away from him. So, uh, yeah, because they had asked, I mean, in these letters, they had asked him to voluntarily surrender his medical. Um, so that being said, what are the lessons learned? Well, the NTSB came up with several recommendations that were targeted to the FAA regarding experimental aircraft. And while they're quite old and um, I haven't had a chance and I don't think you guys have had a chance to follow up to see how they were closed out with the NTSB. Um, whether they, the FAA did make any of these changes or not. I think the, the thing for our audience is really, especially in the experimental aircraft world, is to pull this report and, and read about what the board found with the modifications, because they did get into some uh, extensive discussion with the original builder of the airplane and, and the folks that had owned it, um, and, and reflect on what you know or who you know who may be modifying these airplanes um, that may not be in concert with what the manufacturer has recommended with regard to building this particular aircraft or a, a particular aircraft. And so it's important that for our audience, you know, there are lessons learned. There are lessons learned. There are lessons learned in every single accident. And I think this is a good one for the experimental aircraft community to really understand and see what, what can be done to improve aviation safety in that particular arena. Yeah, stop, stop modifying your airplane, uh, you know, just because you want to do something. I, I haven't looked at a lot of light sport aircraft, but I think that they're another area that may be uh, ripe for individual owners to make, make additions to the airplane that, that maybe the designers never envisioned. Yeah. It's, it's uh, you know, it's uh, in some ways, this whole segment of general aviation is the Wild West. Uh, it, it is to an extent, John, because um, we, we, I mean, we have the freedom to go out and build a flying machine um, under certain parts of the federal aviation regulations that allows, you know, pilots or designers, aircraft, you know, people that are just aviation enthusiasts to go out and build a flying machine. And that's great. I mean, that gives us a lot of different freedom. And, but you still have to remain in the, <laughs> inside the boundaries of <laughs> whether you've designed it yourself or you bought a kit who has a series or at least a group of engineers who have designed this aircraft. They've done all the necessary requisite testing. And if you then arbitrarily go out and take that aircraft beyond what the manufacturer recommends, or at least is intended for that aircraft, now you've gone into, like we always talk about for pilots who get themselves into situations beyond the capability of the airplane. Now they become the test pilot. Well, now you've really become the test pilot because now you've modified an aircraft that you really don't know what it's going to do. Even though you think that this modification could improve something, it could make that airplane disastrous uh, in its operation. And so that's why uh, for the experimental aircraft community, um, there, again, there are some just 
extraordinary airplanes out there and the people that build these airplanes take a lot of pride in it the you know the the two of you along with myself we know a number of guys who have built their own airplane um one of our friends <laughs> was uh was a prominent character over at the FAA who built his own airplane and posted about it on Facebook and stuff and you know it's a, a sense of pride and joy and you know uh, I don't expect that the the wings are going to fall off his airplane uh, anytime soon. But again, you have a pilot like a John Denver who buys this airplane and really didn't process why would the fuel selector be way over here in a position that could really hurt me when I need it the most. I mean, why isn't that processing? Because there are a lot of long easies out there for sale get one that was built properly or built correctly or not modified that makes it difficult for a pilot to fly the airplane through all phases of flight to include abnormal and emergency situations yes as i remember correctly if i remember correctly uh, we had a lot of discussion too about not only having to turn around and use pliers to, to turn that valve, but also that the valve was very difficult to turn. Yes. They may have had the packing really tight because they may have had a leak on it, or it may have been just uh, the owner suspecting he might get a leak and wanted to make that packing very, very tight, which makes it very difficult to turn. It's a basic valve, as I remember in that. In, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time on the valve and on his actions around the valve because that was really the crutch of the accident, what he did or didn't do. And uh, but the, all these other points came up, uh, which impact upon a safe operation. And and his decision making was one of the the biggest piece in the very beginning. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if he decided to put put uh, fill the tanks up. He might still be here today. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of what ifs with this accident, and it was a real shock to the people that I know who were very close to him and tried to rationalize what he may have been doing, what he was thinking, why he was doing these things, why he didn't do this, why he didn't do that. And, and it's always the what ifs of these accidents that not only have a, a, a tremendous impact, on family and friends, but even us as investigators, because we're trying to put some rational thinking to sometimes irrational behavior. And, and it's frustrating because we as investigators want to have a rational conclusion that's logical so that we can learn from it and then take those lessons learned and educate others. And, and it makes like this accident it is a bit frustrating because it's just like i would never buy an airplane that has a fuel selector that i can't see that isn't marked that i mean it's just well, I, i'll go find another airplane <laughs> you know flying is a process and we have a very firm process for commercial pilots and those pilots still make mistakes and those pilots still get in trouble yeah when you come down to the general aviation community, you've, you've given much more freedom. You're not held to a checklist. You're not held to these other, this, this whole process is a lot looser and you're, you have a better control of it yourself. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that everybody is going to exercise the same level of caution in every step of the way, yeah. you know? And I, I preach the, the pre-flight, I preach, uh, pre-planning all the time and keeping your eyes open after you're on the ground. Why? Because we know that those three areas alone have killed a lot of people, crashed a lot of airplanes, mm -hmm. trying to reinforce that point every single show that we do. Right? But there are so many people out there that are flying that just disregard all of that. Yep. I still see it. I go to the FBO and I see guys you know, as you say, Greg, they run out the door, you know, light the fire and let's get out of here. Yeah. You know, kick the tires, light the fire, and away we go. Yeah. And that, that's a recipe for sooner or later, a disaster is going to happen. Yeah. 
Agreed. Well, gentlemen, this was a good accident to talk about um, because, uh, uh, because of, and again, I hate that word, anniversary. It, we're not celebrating anything, um, but it is the fact that we must recognize that it has been 25 years and we lost somebody that did contribute a lot uh, to the world of music and, and to waste that talent over something like this um, is, is really uh, just very disheartening. So, so with that, my friend, Todd, I will leave you with the second to the last word. <laughs> well, one good thing about the review of this accident, which i have been looking at since it happened back in 97, was I was able to carefully look through a lot of the public docket and a lot of the other information. One of the things that struck me is that here's a person who made a decision, not just during the flight, but years before. He had an issue with alcohol. He had an issue that was publicly known about alcohol because he had a, at least a couple of arrests for driving under the influence. And he knew clearly that he was in violation of the rules and still wanted to fly. And it's just a reminder that, uh, yeah, you can get away with violating the regulations. But you got to ask yourself, if you're going to go through your aviation career blatantly violating the regulations and flying when you legally shouldn't be flying, you might call into question your decision making across the whole spectrum of your aviation experience. Yeah, that's a good point. And to you, my friend, I will leave you with our last word. Okay. And I, I'm going to add something to it this time. Todd, don't you and I look at celebrity crashes? Because as we were going through this, I was in my mind, I was thinking about some other notable celebrities that have had accidents. We know about the JFK one. We might revisit that one. That's a good one. And, uh, and also we have a number of movie stars. We have some other notable musician types that have lost their life uh, in airplanes because of uh, sometimes poor selection of the charter companies that they hire. You know, their managers hire them. And uh, there's all sorts of stories that float around about managers and, and the, the money that's spent on those charters and the distribution of that money uh, afterwards. So we, we, we will collaborate a little bit and do some work. There might be some enlightening uh, events there. But for all of our listeners, I am going to preach again. If you're planning on going flying, the key word is planning. You need to do some pre-planning. Do that before you leave the house initially. Then do the final and thorough pre-plan at the airport or close to it. When you get out to the airplane, do a thorough pre-flight. Touch your airplane. Wiggle the controls if you can reach them. You know, watch for the tire pressures. I just was looking at an accident with a Learjet that was caused by tire pressure. And years ago, I remember a DC-8 that, that crashed because of tire pressure. So make sure that you do what you're supposed to do on a pre-flight and make sure the airplane is okay to go. And after you get off the ground, put that head on a swivel. There's a lot of airplanes flying out there, a lot of students flying out there. Uh, both getting instructions and on their own need you need to know what's going on around your airplane right so please pay attention and fly safely to listen or watch more episodes of this show go to flightsafetydetectives.com the flight safety detectives youtube channel or your favorite place to listen to podcasts to contact John and Greg about the show, send them an email at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. And remember, for aviation insurance needs, contact Avemco Insurance at avemco.com or give them a call at 888-879-0389. Mention Flight Safety Detectives and receive a 5% discount. Thanks for listening to the Flight Safety Detectives, and remember to always fly safe.